Hello and welcome to Me Read This. My name's Ash. Today I'm going to talk about a poem by W.H. Auden called September the 1st, 1939. Uh, it was originally published in the New Republic on the 18th of October, 1939. Um, later, it appeared in W.H. Auden's collection, uh, Another Time, published uh, the year after, in 1940. First, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the biographical details and... Um, the historical context, I'm going to talk about the build-up to World War II, uh, and then we get into the um, the poem proper, we're going to talk a- about why it's so fixated on the inner world, the private versus the public, and also why W.H. Auden later disowned the poem. If you'd like to follow along, I'm going to upload a photo of each stanza to Instagram, at this, so you know exactly where I am once I get to... Um, going through the poem line by line. It's not going to be quite line by line, but um, I'm not going to read the whole thing out. It's 99 lines long. That's why I'm not going to read it out. It's written in the tradition of public poetry. The rhythm is borrowed from a poem by W.B. Yeats called Easter 1916. Its nine stanzas uh, are 11 lines long and are composed of just one sentence. The poet Joseph Brodsky pointed out that the thought unit corresponds exactly to the stanzaic unit, which corresponds also to the grammatical unit. Every thought is a sentence, every sentence is a stanza. This idea of public poetry is going to be quite important, but we'll get into that later. For now, I just want to say I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm sorry it's been so long. Before we get into it, though, I'd just like to say a a big thank you to Caleb James and MK BB Watson, who are the first two people to um, sign up to our Patreon way way earlier than than we we imagined thank you so much caleb and mary they will both be the first two exclusive listeners to the first patreon only episode which i can now reveal will be on creation the first story from the metamorphoses by ovid and if that makes their heart sink well caleb and mary it's too late i'm afraid um (laughs) you're getting it and i'm going to address the entire episode to you both. Caleb is the co-host of the book podcast Drunken Pen Writing. Um, check out drunkenpenwriting.com and the Drunken Pen Writing podcast. I appeared on it uh, a month or so ago on an episode about how to write a good story. Um, they've got loads of great stuff, so check them out. And as for MK BB Watson, she not only has supported the podcast and offered some great advice ever since pretty much we started she's also an illustrator um and you can check out her rendition of midsummer night's dream by going to amazon and looking up mk bb watson uh tangled shakespeare thank you very much to you both and i will now get into the episode along with much of the rest of the uncertain and afraid world the poet wh auden was listening to the radio during the munich crisis of 1938 He later wrote publicly that with excellent political reasons, he had done so hoping for war. Germany had violated the Treaty of Versailles by posting forces to the Rhineland in 1936. Some commentators, like George Bernard Shaw, didn't share Auden's excellent political reasons. Shaw wrote that there was no difference between Germany's reoccupation of the Rhineland and England reoccupying Portsmouth. But two years later, Nazi forces annexed Austria and Hitler was now threatening to do the same to the Sudeten region of Czechoslovakia as well. In these years building up to the war, Auden had written, violence successful like a new disease and wrong a charmer everywhere invited. The governments of Britain and France had sent their leaders to meet with Hitler and try to find a diplomatic solution. The Nazis had surely asked too much. If they didn't desist, war seemed inevitable. However, Hitler was amazed at how far he was allowed to push his luck. The British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain asked him if, aside from the Rhineland and Austria, there was anything else he'd like. Yes, there was. The Sudetenland, and with it, de facto control of Czechoslovakia. Very well then, job done. Neville Chamberlain flew home declaring, peace for our time. On first reading, Auden saying candidly that he had been hoping for war sounds oddly callous. But he had recognised, like many others, that any attempt of diplomatic reconciliation with Nazi Germany was futile. The efforts of Chamberlain and French Prime Minister Deladier were merely the last clever hopes for peace expiring. What's more surprising is Auden's private communication to his brother John, in which he told him that hoping for war was part of his death wish, 
a feeling that death would solve my problem. Part of his problem was Auden's inability to reconcile his private, visionary and poetic experience with the public world. Wishing for death to solve it sounds more than callous, a dangerous, masochistic sentiment more familiar with young men in the lead-up to the First World War, and not those anxious and restless young men writing in the lead-up to the Second. Strange to hear, coming from a poet who was sensitive and prescient when it came to the cold, controlled ferocity of the human species. Strange too, in light of Auden's experience. A decade before, when he was in his early 20s, Auden left Britain and travelled to Berlin. It was a hectic period which saw the poet relishing the Weimar underworld of orgies and strumpets, but also one in which he said he ceased to see the world in terms of verse. In the words of Auden's biographer Richard Davenport Hines, it was a time of hard living, hard reading and hard thinking. On this trip, he met W.H.R. Rivers, a neurologist who had treated shell-shocked soldiers at Craig Lockhart Hospital in Edinburgh during World War I. Amongst his patients were the poets Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. Rivers made a lasting impression on Sassoon, as well as Sassoon's fellow poet and soldier, Robert Graves. All three of these poets were from a generation before Auden, and all three had tried to commit to poetry their experiences on the front. The attempt had forced them all to confront the tension between a beautiful world and a true one. Sassoon had struggled with the image of himself as a warrior poet. Graves had published his war poetry during the 20s, written a memoir called Goodbye to All That, and afterwards, true to his title, disparaged his war poems and didn't include them in any future collections. I am not concerned with poetry, Wilfred Owen wrote, but war and the pity of war. The poets that followed them, the poets of the 30s, lived in times that Auden himself had christened the Age of Anxiety. It wasn't hard to see how that applied to the population as a whole, as indeed it isn't when that phrase is appropriated for any other age. But the specific anxiety for the poets living in the shadow of the Great War was its radical effect on poetry. Auden's early poems were noted for their peculiarities of style. Shorn of punctuation, they read like dispatches of great urgency, written without a word to lose. He didn't believe that it was a requirement of poets to be warriors. I shall be a bloody bad soldier, he said of his trip to Spain during the Civil War. However, he did believe that in critical times, poets needed direct knowledge of major political events. Rather contradicting this attitude, in January 1939, as Europe was sliding towards war, Auden and Christopher Isherwood left for America. It was a move that attracted bitter derision that Auden was still coming in for long into his life. In 1951, Evelyn War sneered that Auden fled to America at the first squeak of an air raid siren. According to John Fuller, the novelty of the new country for the two poets lay principally in its providing a fresh context for the universal problem. But the problem of money was also a factor. Isherwood and Auden embarked on a whirl of social dates, shamelessly hunting for wealthy patrons as well as writing and giving readings. Hunting for patrons at a time like that, can you imagine anything so tasteless? Patreon.com slash read this. Across the Atlantic, Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia. In March, the governments of France and Britain gave guarantees to Poland that if in the case of a German invasion, they would offer their full support. I'll brew them a devil's potion, fumed Hitler when he heard the news. On the 6th of April, a blonde-haired 18-year-old called Chester Coleman and his blonde-haired friend Harold Norse went to see a reading given by Isherwood Auden and Louis McNeese. Throughout the night, the two blondes sat in the audience and flirted with Isherwood, who afterwards gave Norse his address. Coleman somehow acquired these details and went on his own to pay a visit to the famous poet. But instead, it was Auden who opened the door, commenting to Isherwood, It's the wrong blonde. The wrong blonde, Chester Coleman, would turn out to be the great love of Auden's life. Hitler was also amassing young blonde men and spent the summer preparing for war, signing a non-aggression pact with the Soviets and devising a propaganda pretext for invading Poland. He intended to start his war on the 26th of August. Troops were ordered to advance across the Polish border, but then just hours later were called off. The reason being that Mussolini had surprised Hitler by saying he was in no position to offer military support. As Hitler raged, the war was on hold for just a few more days. Travelling from California to New York with Coleman on the 28th of August, Auden wrote in a letter, There is a radio in this coach, so that every hour or so, one has a violent pain in one's stomach as the news comes on. By the time you get this, I suppose, we shall know one way or the other. On the 30th of August, according to Max Hastings, the curtain rose on the first appropriately sordid act of the conflict. The German security service led a party dressed in Polish uniforms and including a dozen convicted criminals dismissively codenamed Tin Cans in a mock assault on the German radio station in Upper Silesia. Shots were fired. 
Polish patriotic slogans were broadcast across the airwaves, then the attackers withdrew. SS machine gunners killed the tin cans, whose blood-stained corpses were arranged for display to foreign correspondents, as evidence of Polish aggression. Around half four in the morning of the 1st of September, the first official shots of the Second World War were fired. In his diary, Auden wrote, Such a beautiful evening, and in an hour, they say, England will be at war. On the same evening, he had gone to Dizzy's Club on West 52nd Street, alone. There, he had begun to compose a poem. Harold Norse, the original and intended blonde, has pictured the visit. With floppy shoelaces, creased suit and tie, ash-stained, he must have looked out of place. Aware of the age difference and quite shy, he would have selected one of the two unused corner tables at the rear of the bar, which was usually deserted except for those too drunk to stand, from which he could observe boys kissing and groping under the bright lights. Surely he jotted notes, or even the first stanzas, for it begins with the immediacy of composition in situ. I sit in one of the dives on 52nd Street, uncertain and afraid, as the clever hopes expire of a low, dishonest decade. I'm going to just go through um, chunk by chunk. What I'll do is I'll put a picture up of the poem, probably on the Instagram, at ear read this, so you can kind of read along. I'm not going to read the whole thing, it's a long poem, but I'll, I might just refer to certain lines. So in this first stanza we have, I sit in one of the dives on 52nd Street. Auden had gone to Dizzy's Club, this dive, on the recommendation of Coleman and Norse, where he, had, he certainly started the poem, but seems to have revised or completed it in New Jersey over the next few days, the first few days of World War II, at Coleman's father's house. I've got no idea if such clubs... Um, as Dizzy's existed in England at the time. I know that Auden had a very difficult time as a as a gay man um, in England. He once had to spend five pounds buying a man's silence after he was discovered in bed with John Betjeman. Uh, but anyway, as the clever hopes expire of a low, dishonest decade. Clever hopes was originally mad hopes until um, Auden realised that Chamberlain, Deladier, etc. were not mad, but arrogant, clever and, and stubborn. Later he describes Hitler as a psychopathic god and it, it would weaken that if he described all leaders as, as mad, having mad hopes. Um, there's something much sadder about them being clever hopes. Now in order to get um, the word decade, which I would usually say decade, um, to rhyme with afraid, you do need to put the emphasis on the um, second syllable, decade, which um, I have seen some people say it's because he's talking about the end of the decade, 1939. I think that's a little bit too cute. I think decade is a just a, a traditional pronunciation. Anyway, I don't know. Um, waves of anger and fear circulate over the bright. Waves of anger and fear, meaning rumour, reprisals, but also literally uh, airwaves. That sickening news from the radio that you heard in the, um, in the coach. I think... I think the way he talks about the radium implies he had a bit of a horror of how quickly news could travel. Um, you know, presenters unreasoned and unchecked getting information out there as soon as it happens, as opposed to, you know, the written word being a lot more considered. Can you imagine writing a letter from a bus? Circulate over the bright and darkened corners of the earth, obsessing our private lives. There's a to and fro th throughout this whole whole poem of private and public, um, something that's come up on the podcast a couple of times. But um, according to Edward Mendelssohn, um, who is, I think, Auden's literary executor um, and uh, wrote two enormous critical biographies, early Auden and later Auden, obsessing has its archaic and literal sense, he says, meaning um, you're not obsessed with something, uh, but, but by it. It obsesses you. Um, moths aren't obsessed with porch lights. Their minds can wander during the day. They can think of other things. But, you know, once a porch light comes on, it obsesses them. Sort of like haunted. So whether it's waves of anger and fear in terms of rumour or warmongering or it's the airwaves, they, they're intruding into your personal life. So your, your private life is becoming politicised. Everyone is a politician. Um, yeah. The unmentionable odour of death offends the September night. There's already a sense here, and we're going to see it grow throughout the poem, of chronic fatigue at the effort of involving yourself in the world. 
the odor of death is unmentionable, and the knight is offended um, by the by the uh, spectacle of it, by the chance of it. People just wanted to go away. Second stanza. Accurate scholarship can unearth a whole offence from Luther until now that has driven a culture mad. Yeah, accurate scholarship. There's something so so withering about accurate scholarship. He's saying, uh, if you read up on Luther, if you find out what occurred at Linz, by which he means um, where Hitler grew up, there are lots of rumours of um, Hitler senior dishing out beatings to... Um, Little Adolf, although it, it does hardly seem enough for the creation of a, of a psychopathic god. Ian Kershaw, in this enormous biography of Hitler, pretty thoroughly debunked any of the other weirder sort of childhood trauma explanations for the monster of Hitler, including concealed uh, Jewishness, genital deformities, some malevolent Jewish doctor at his mother's deathbed, etc., etc. There's really nothing to substantiate any of those, according to Ian Kershaw. So yes, in this in this stanza he compares second stanza he compares the public madness of fascism and the private madness of Hitler. Fascism is the Luther bit, Hitler is the Linz bit. From Luther until now, that has driven a culture mad. He Auden wrote in um, his preface to Poets of the English Language. The dualism inaugurated by Luther, Machiavelli and Descartes has brought us to the end of our tether and we know that either we must discover a unity which can repair the fissures that separate the individual from society, feeling from intellect and conscience from both, or we shall surely die by spiritual despair and physical annihilation. Yeah, the landscape of this poem is very much those fissures separating individual and the society. Incidentally, on Julius Stryker's, um, he was the editor of Der Stürmer, um, on his birthday in 1937, the city of Nuremberg presented him with a first edition of Luther's On Jews and Their Lies, um, which goes some way to saying why. Um, Auden included um, the phrase from Luther until now. But I don't really think that um, Auden's being particularly earnest about saying, go and, go and look up what has driven a whole culture mad from Luther until now and find out how many shoes Hitler Sr. threw at his, his son. It sort of, it doesn't matter, he says... Uh, I and the public know what all school children learn. Those to whom evil is done do evil in return. He's saying that it's staring you in the face. It's not... You don't need any accurate scholarship to understand how this has happened. Note the distance between I and the public. Auden's definitely placing himself outside of the the public. He is... He's not one of them, and that that will get an even stronger sense of that as we go on. There's something um, sort of sinister and kind of sing-song about that. Um, all school children learn those to whom email, evil is done do evil in return he's chosen to give it that kind of sin song rhyme I think because it's it sounds then that it's been drilled into them almost that it's been a, a commercial we'll come back to commercials because there's a um, interesting historical connection to a infamous TV commercial this line um, is not the poem's most notorious line however it was it, was, it caused a bit of a stir someone wrote into the TLS when this poem was first published, calling it a, a meretricious piece of work that, despite its seductive cadences, should be consigned to the scrap heap. Um, he particularly hated uh, the, these lines, those to whom evil is done do evil in return, and called them a, a ringing apologia for the Third Reich as a product of Versailles. Saying we shouldn't be masochistic about it, I think, is the point. Funnily enough, Christopher Hitchens calls this one of his favourite poems, and... I think somewhere I said perhaps the finest of um, Auden's. Auden certainly didn't have the same view, but I, it seems strange because um, if anyone's familiar with Christopher Hitchens, they'll know how much he despises the idea of those to whom evil is done to evil in return, um, as evidenced by his scorn for anyone with any masochistic sentiments about 9-11. Um, there are some 9-11 connections coming up as well. Um, this sounds unscripted, doesn't it? But... It's all knitted together. It's not. It's a bunch of penciled notes, and I'm uh, I'm missing loads out. Anyway, the huge imago is a phrase borrowed from Jung. Auden said Jung hardly went far enough when he said Hitler is the unconscious of every German. He comes uncomfortably near to being the unconscious of most of us. You would think this was even more shocking than uh, those to whom evil is done, etc. Um, third stanza. Exiled Thucydides knew that all all that a speech can say about democracy and what dictators do 
The elderly rubbish they talk to an apathetic grave. Expanding on the point before about accurate scholarship, um, saying that it's all there in the book of Thucydides from centuries and centuries ago. The book he's actually referring to is um, Thucydides' critique of the Peloponnesian War, in which he talked about the nature of dictators, but also that of the people, and found them not just complacent, but intellectually dead. Again, we have this horrible sense of um, things being inevitable and completely out of our control, the habit-forming pain, this management and grief, we must suffer them all again. Because we're helpless, because we have... Um, because the nature of dictators hasn't changed and we must suffer them all again, the the Enlightenment will be driven away. Um, the Enlightenment being a reference to the Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries, a great boom of reason and individualism, which profited scientific advances, philosophic advances, artistic advances, but dictatorship will um, will spell goodbye, for, goodbye to all that in making individuals subservient and, and collectivized. Fourth stanza. Into this neutral air where blind skyscrapers use their full height to proclaim the strength of collective man. Neutral air, like, um, like waves of anger and fear being both rumors and um, airwaves. Neutral air, the neutral air of America, currently not involved in the war, but also neutral in that kind of apathetic way. Um, there's a bit of a, a mocking tone again to this blind sk skyscrapers that using their full height to proclaim the strength of collective man. Um, what good is the full strength of collective man if it hasn't, um, if it's blind to the international wrong and its own res its responsibilities to correct it? Out of the mirror they stare, imperialism's face and the international wrong. Not just um, not just a rallying cry for for global responsibility for people to not stay neutral, but also a bit of a um, personal comment he's he's being he's able to talk about whole countries looking in the mirror as well as um individuals he once said uh there's a bit in mendelssohn which i've got here he observed to friends how common it was to find a dedicated anti-fascist who conducted his erotic life as if he was invading poland next we have more of this sense of anonymous homogenized population faces along the bar clinging to their average day there's a very sort of childish feeling to this whole whole stanza um it ends with saying use any convention possible to to pretend things aren't as bad as they really are i love this bit all the conventions conspire to make this fort assume the furniture of home on one hand saying neutral or not this place is already a fort but at the same time it has that has such a lovely uh it's kind of kiddish ring you think of making a fort out of furniture also, rhyme-wise, faces along the bar cling to their average day. The lights must never go out. The music must always play. This is very sort of Ring Around the Roses type stuff. And then it goes, All the conventions conspire to make this fort assume the furniture of home. There's some similar noises there, and there's some alliteration, but uh, the rhyme's totally gone. It's like the furniture's actually not that comfy. Okay, next. The windiest militant trash. I think that's my favourite line of the poem. One, one hand utterly um, withering about... The uh, what important person shout, windy, militant trash. But also, visually, it's, it summons up a kind of uh, scrap blowing across a wasteland. Apocalyptic, bombed out, you know, newspapers dotting across yesterday's battleground. Windiest, militant trash. Love that. So this, uh, this stanza has a reference to Matt Nijinsky, the ballet dancer Nijinsky, and, oh God, Diaghilev. Diaghilev? Sorry about that, Diaghilev. <laughs> That's as good as I'm going to get. I don't know. Um, Auden had read Nijinsky's diary, which um, he had written shortly before losing his mind, in which he attacked his former lover, Diaghilev, and said, uh, some politicians are hypocrites, like Diaghilev, who, does not, who, do, who do not want universal love, but to be loved alone, which um, Auden appropriates for the last lines of this stanza. I think this is the bit that makes it quite clear that Really what he's fearful of is, is the idea of everyone being a politician, everyone being politicised, everyone having this um, uneven or, or rather unfair desire, everyone desiring love more than they're willing to give it. It's not that it's just politicians who um, do that, it's just that the politician is the most extreme result. He wrote, um, Auden wrote of his early days, of, of his poetry sort of university era poetry. The enemy was and still is the politician, i.e. the person who wants to organise the lives of others. 
it's worth pointing out that um, Hitler, when he was writing of his um, early days, his own rise, wrote in Mein Kampf, there is no making pacts with the Jews. There can only be the hard either or. I, however, resolved to become a politician. From the conservative dark into the ethical life, the dense commuters come, repeating their morning vow. I will be true to the wife. I'll concentrate more on my work. From the conservative dark into the ethical life. Conservative dark is your private life, individualism, your selfishness, um, your inner thoughts, your inner weaknesses, the ethical life, the, the world you're forced to share, coexistence, having to love one another, um, or at least pretend to. It's nice how we go from dark to life. You almost imagine light, but you don't get it. You get something a little bit, um, a little bit less solid, perhaps. The people really are cattle in this poem. Dense commuters now. They're still faceless. Um, they're very wastelandy. They are the deaf, the dumb, and Auden wonders who can release them. This intellectually dead public with their um, shameful private lives concealed in the conservative dark. All I have is a voice, he says, to undo the folded lie the romantic lie in the brain of the sensual man in the street. A folded lie has the sense of it being a message or a dispatch that's been folded up and carried by a messenger who's not aware of its contents. So Auden's saying his voice will undo this romantic lie. The lie being a delusion of comfort and safety or, and the possibility of being loved alone in a just world. It's another favourite line. Um... The lie of authority whose buildings grope her sky. I love that um, we've already heard these skyscrapers being described as blind. So um, the idea of them groping at something already works. But authority groping at something as superior and intangible as the sky is just perfect. Groping at the sky. Grasping at it for success, but also not being able to cling onto it because, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the sky. Now we come to the most notorious line in the poem, possibly in Auden's canon. Um, it's the last line, oops, it's the last line of um, this penultimate stanza. We must love one another or die. Now it has had a varied response over the years. Um, let's start with uh, Auden's response. He said, rereading a poem of mine, 1st of September, 1939. Oh, he calls it 1st September. I thought it was called September the 1st. Oh, it doesn't matter. After it had been published, I came to the line, we must love one another or die. And I said to myself, that's a damned lie. We must die anyway. So in the next edition, I altered it to, we must love one another and die. This didn't seem to do either, so I cut the stanza. Still no good. The whole poem, I realized, was infected with an incurable dishonesty and must be scrapped. After which, so from the from the mid fifties, he began to refuse permission to editors asking to anthologize the poem. Um, and after the uh, "and die" variant appeared in fifty five, in an anthology of new American verse, strange to think he was anthologizing American verse. It shouldn't be, but kind of is. Um, he allowed it to be printed just once more in the Penguin Poetry of the thirties. Um, but he he added a, a warning to readers. Mr. W. H. Auden considers this poem to be trash, which he is ashamed to have written. I hope you don't feel duped. But it it, um, it was repurposed, and it had a it had a wide and varied impact. This line, E. M. Forster wrote, because he wrote he Auden, because he wrote, we must love one another or die. He can command me to follow him. Now we come to the the um, the TV commercial thing I mentioned earlier. Lyndon B. Johnson used a variation of this line. Um, I think he said, "We must, we must love one another, or we must die." In uh, in a campaign speech, the audio of which was used in a infamous um, TV ad, sort of an anti-war one. I think it's called Daisy. I'll I'll put a link to it on our social media stuff. But it features a, a little girl counting petals off a flower, and then it cuts to um, a, nu a nuclear explosion. I don't know why I laughed at that. Um, and Lyndon B. Johnson saying, we must love one another or we must die. Auden was horrified, but um, made no public comment. He once, I think, I'm not sure if it was in reference to this or not, but he once said, one cannot allow, one cannot let one's name to be associated with shit. So then we come to the last stanza. Uh, we end on a kind of note of submission. It sounds very prayer-like. And w what he meant, 
when he wrote that to his brother about his um, a death wish to cure his problem, was that in his despair, Auden was was looking to world events to solve his personal problems, and in thirty nine they did. Um, his problem of being stuck in the conservative dark, of of not feeling like he was a part of the world, um, goes away. He, instead of hoping for war, by the time war arrives, um, the news makes him weep. Mendelssohn says, because he could now exult in the private world, he could weep for the public one. And what had gone on in his private world was not just um, meeting Chester Coleman. This was a period when Auden had decided on converting to Catholicism, which he does um, the following year, I think, 1940. He says somewhere that his ambition was to become arbitrary. If you can think of think outside of yourself, you can you can become for people. You can offer universal love and not just demand to be loved alone. Which does sort of confuse the poem. The ending of the poem is this note of submission. The start of the poem is where well, it begins with I. I think the uncertainties and, and some of the confusions between that single voice and the note of submission is, is what have enabled the poem to be repurposed for such different um, uses, from Lyndon B. Johnson's campaign to, I mean, it was after 9-11. I, th there are some sort of references which uh, make you well understand why it suddenly became popular after 9-11. I mean, it's written in New York. There's the reference to, um, you know, the strength of blind skyscrapers, which seem almost spooky. Um, but that's the thing. It's spooky. You know, it's not actually... It, I mean, it was it was played on the radio um, after September the 11th, directly afterwards, but obviously with quite a lot of the lines taken out. Um, you know, you have to do some serious editing to, to still to make it uh, to make it fit. Um, but I think it, it's it must seem more fitting in times of disorientation and fear of the unknown. So in the, in the immediate aftermath of an attack from a of an unknown enemy, or the lead up to a war of unknown consequence, has a palpable fear of. Uh, incoming disaster but the disaster is quite vague so people celebrate the its affirmation of love in times of uh, hatred and hardship but it's it, that is probably the vagueness of that is probably the reason why Auden removed it from his um, canon it's, you know it's a bit too simple the psychology is a bit confused I think it's a real hinge point in his career and his thinking um, which makes it interesting for us as students of him and it can it can be very rousing in periods of uncertainty and fear, but seem a little bit shallow and simple in the wake of a great conflict. And you, when you discover, well, what people started to discover in 1945, I guess. Gary uh, Kamaya says, poetry that attempts to engage too specifically and polemically with politics is not usually the poetry that lasts. As an engaged work, a rallying cry of defiance to Hitler... Um, September the 1st, 1939, falls short, but as a meditation on the darkness that infects the human condition and a haunting description of what it felt like to watch the world collapse from the neutral air of New York, it remains strange and alive. So, yeah, that says that a lot better than I said it. As for Auden's last work on, his, on, an, on this poem, he said, I pray to God I shall never be memorable like that again. That's about it for today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you want to keep in touch, you can look up uh, eat read this on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at eat read this or facebook.com slash eat read this. Thank you again to Caleb James and to MK Watson for supporting us on Patreon. If you'd like to do the same, you'll not only get an exclusive episode of eat read this if you choose the Dickensian tier, um, but you'll also be able to find out everything that we've got coming up and email in your questions to eat read this at gmail.com. If you'd like to do the same, please visit uh, patreon.com slash this. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, please consider uh, leaving us a review on iTunes or just liking us on Facebook and that kind of thing. Thank you very much. Next time um, we will be talking about Robert Louis Stevenson. Until then, happy reading. Beep.